So I'm sitting here with um, Sean Canan from Health Matters. Sean agreed to jump on and um, we're going to have a conversation and answer a couple of questions around uh, VO2 max testing and especially around what the data on your heart rate monitors and your apps that, that tells you at the end of the training session um, and I suppose different physiological kind of underpinnings to what's going on in those apps and how they're relevant to you as an athlete and especially as a coach and the information that a coach might want to uh, know about an athlete's fitness, conditioning, etc., as they get ready for a tournament uh, or an event of some kind. So we've got a lot of questions in, um, lots from the kickboxing world and some from the kayaking world as well, believe it or not, which is great. And some just questions in from people who are looking to stay fit. So Sean is a um, sports performance uh, specialist, a fitness specialist, and has been running and owning um, Health Matters since 2009. Sean, is that correct? 2011, I set it up. 2011. So I worked in Australia with the equipment in 2009. So cool. I so over back. to you. You you far away there, and let us know who you are and how you're keeping. Yeah, yeah I'm good, thanks. Uh, happy to be on here and, and help educate and kind of rule a couple of or bring home a couple of truths. So um, mm -hmm. as John said, I'm a sports performance specialist. So I've run Health Matters since April 2011 in Ireland. I've done just under 10,000 VO2 tests. So I'm the most active tester in Europe. I don't think there's many people in the world that will have done more VO2 tests than me. So I've seen it all. Um, I'm very passionate about what I do. I really enjoy what I do. And I work with the, like, the spectrum of that person I work with rather than just saying athlete. I work with professional athletes and I've even carried out VO2 testing on the effects of exercise on obese pregnant women. So a really interesting clinical trial we done in the Coombe Hospital about six years ago. So like VO2 isn't just necessarily for athletes, although it is really, really beneficial and a lot of our talk will be all around um, the benefits of it for, for a professional athlete. But it, it isn't just for athletes. There is, there's many benefits. And I think one of the good things, and I was talking to someone recently and they were saying that VO2 should be really used as a health marker even in this current epidemic, he said, I wonder how many people that scored well in a VO2 test have got coronavirus. Hmm. You know, like it would be really interesting because VO2 is relevant to health. So VO2 is your gold standard measurement for fitness. I got to know, I got to know Sean maybe six or seven years ago and um, just by reaching out to get one of my athletes tested uh, in a VO2 max test. First time ever doing it and kind of first time being introduced to the results of that test and what it told me as a, as a coach was um, was enlightening um, and kind of paved the way for the rest of the training program as we went on to win the European Championships that year. I don't know if you remember Lauren doing the test many years ago with yeah. you, Sean. Yeah. So I think it's a good place to start, isn't it? Like, so there's lots of um, you know, lots of pictures out there, lots of people with masks on their face and saying they're getting the VO2 max test. But Sean, what is it? What's it all about? What does it tell the athlete and what does it tell the coach? Okay, so VO2, what it means and what it stands for is volume of oxygen, and it measures how much oxygen a client or an athlete is consuming in milliliters per kiloweight of body mass averaged over a minute. So that's really important is the, the relevance to body weight. So VO2 is relevant at a moment in time when you get tested. And using fighters as an example, one of the biggest ways to change your VO2 max is to decrease body weight. So if you decrease body weight, you're going to score a higher VO2. So VO2, although like some people will argue that VO2 is only a marker of potential rather than a pure indicator of performance, which, which is correct. Mm. However, I would rather know if my athletes are exposed to high volumes of oxygen rather than low volumes of oxygen. So you have to remember with the human body, the higher content of oxygen you consume per kiloweight of body mass, the more efficient you're going to be. Now we're going to get into this in a lot more detail as the conversation goes on, but what it is, it's about performing efficiently, performing aerobically, which means that you're working with the presence of oxygen. So within a VO2 test, so often people just say, sure, what's the benefit of having a VO2? It's only a number. But within a VO2 test, what you'll get is you'll get your VO2 score, which is your fitness level. You'll get your max heart rate. You'll get your recovery percentages heart rate, so one and two minute recovery. You get your four training zones, you'll get your threshold identification, you'll get your calorie expenditure, you'll look at fractional exchange of gas, which is how much oxygen you're using, lung capacity, lung function, breathing patterns, ventilation. Like it's, it's endless how much detail we could really go into. So this whole idea that a VO2 test is just a measurement on lung 
capacity is wrong because within a VO2 test, you're not going to describe each one of those points when you're trying to promote a service. I call it a VO2 test, but within the VO2 test, you're given endless amounts of information for an individual. And let's always use combat sport as an example. And by all means, John, we can talk about kayaking. I've tested rowers. Just from the get-go, the test is available as a run test, a row test, or a bike test. So depending on what your discipline is, we would then say, okay, well, this is where we're going to do what you're going to do your test on. If you have kind of field sports, you get them to do run tests naturally because they're going to be running rather than cycling or rowing. Mm -hmm. If you have no experience in rowing, I would definitely not promote people to do it a row test because it's a power test realistically and you have to increase power output, mm -hmm. which can be very difficult to do over a, a relatively long period of time. Traditionally, rowers are used for intervals for people that aren't into the sport. Same with the bike test. The bike test, you have to create power the whole time. And if you're not conditioned in creating power outputs through the lower limbs, you're, you're going to fail on the test early. So your data will differ from run test, row test, and bike test. For your traditional MMA athletes or kickboxers, we would promote them to do it as a stand or as a, as a run test. However, I, I'm doing a lot of work with professional MMA athletes. And if we know at the start of camp that there is an injury or an underlying condition that we know that the running aspect of the camp is not going to be there, we would test on a bike. So then we can program their data and their training regime based on the findings from bike testing in order for them to carry out bike fitness throughout the camp. Mm. So what's the, what's the, uh, the commonalities? I know you've probably tested hundreds of combat sports fighters from across the years and from different levels, um, endurance levels, but what are the commonalities across um, fighters who would have a high VO2 max? Like, what, what, what's it looking like? So if you were to put your finger on a number of high-end athletes, what would be the commonalities across those tests? Right, so what we're looking for, realistically, now obviously it's going to vary. So VO2 at a point in a camp is going to, the data is going to vary. So we would traditionally, let's say we have an athlete that has a fight in 12 weeks. We would test them at the very start of the camp, which would get them at their lowest point. Mm. So theoretically, they've taken a bit of time off. They're not at their peak performance and we get measurements at that point. And then we program off that. But when you're looking for or the question, what commonalities you're going to see with a high-end MMA athlete, you're going to want a big VO2, relatively big. You're talking high 50s, early 60s. You want to have, and the, one of the biggest things that I need, or my whole job when I work with an athlete is to get them efficient. So we want to make them as aerobically sound as possible. So we want mm -hmm. the threshold to be as high as possible. Yeah. But the, one of the big things with an MMA athlete or a combat sport athlete is that we need the recovery to be good. So within a minute, you need to have the ability for your heart rate to reduce to change energy systems. So in terms of commonalities, three main things we look for, good VO2, good recovery, high threshold. Generally, what you're going to see when somebody comes in at the start of a camp is VO2 is is okay, uh, and VO2 isn't the be all and end all for me with a, a combat athlete or any athlete. I'm looking more in terms of how their body's performing. The recovery isn't going to be where we want it to be, and the threshold certainly isn't going to be where it wants to be. So we're going to need to program in order for the body to adapt and allow them to become more efficient and to get their recovery higher. Now, the mm -hmm. reason we want their threshold to be high and the recovery to be high. So what I talk about is threshold. Threshold stands for or anaerobic threshold. It's when your body changes energy systems. So aerobic, we're efficient. Anaerobic, we're inefficient. 80, 90% of combat athletes are going to be anaerobic for their three or five minute round. Without a shadow of a doubt, yeah. it's an explosive sport. You're going to be using that anaerobic pathway. But I want you to come out, take a break for a minute and walk back out aerobic. I know and I've been told so many times by top MMA athletes that I work with. And I'll always remember, I went to watch uh, one of the lads I was working with in the National Boxing Stadium. It was a Muay Thai event. And it went to a five-rounder. It was only scheduled for three rounds. We had to go five rounds. And he said to me after he won the title, that he fourth and fifth round, he walked out from the corner, looking across the pond. And psychologically, he knew he was back recovered within a minute. And he said the boost in confidence that gave him was phenomenal because he knew he was efficient for a very short or maybe a long period of time within that round, but he knew yeah. he had the ability to recover and perform. Yeah, yeah. So we want combat sport athletes to push that threshold up as much as they can. I can never guarantee you you're going to be aerobic for a full round. If you are, you're going to win, mm. <laughs> unless yeah. unless you get knocked out. If it's you a, have... Yeah, if you're aerobic, it's a walk in the park, as they say. Yeah, yeah. like you yeah. should be able to perform really, really well 
yeah. for the duration of that bout. Yeah. And yeah. Un if, unless you get caught or something. You, you yeah, hundred percent. And I think that's kind of a, a common um, a common mistake by athletes thinking that the the idea is to kind of stay on a roll as much as possible. You know, to try stay within that threshold as much as possible, which is a fine line between fatigue and and performance. Yeah. So what does what do those um, what do those stats look like? What what do what would a readout look like, and how would you interpret that? Right. So let me just pull up a file here, and I will share it with you. Um. So, can you see that? It says you're going to start sharing the screen, and there we go. Right. So if we look at the left hand side, um, this is if you follow the cursor. So this VO2 score for this athlete was a sixty-eight point three. So 68.3 is a, is a yeah, really, really high good. score. It's, it's a great VO2 max. So let's look at numbers of VO2. So if you look at performance, um, field sport athletes, male, you're going to be scoring in the 50s professional. You Female, you'll be looking at high 40s, early 50s. Endurance athletes, you're going to be wanting high 50s, early 60s. Female, you're looking at kind of mid 50s to high 50s. And then you know you're dealing with some really, really high level athletes when you're pushing up towards high 60s, early 70s. The highest ever recorded in the world was a 96. That was a cross country yeah. skier. The highest I've ever tested was an 89.8. What sport was, was that, Sean? He was a runner. He runs a 14 minute 5K. Hmm. So just to put that into context, <laughs> yeah. he, was, he was six foot three, very lean. He was an accountant. I told him he should have packed in his daytime job and started to run. <laughs> But um, that's just our point. So this is what some of the data would look like. So 68.3 was his VO2 max. His max heart rate was 185. Now me knowing this protocol off by heart, I'm just trying to work out speed. So he got to pretty much 18 minutes of the test. He was running 18, kilometer, yeah, 18 kilometers an hour on a 6% gradient at that point. So he, he was moving and his heart rate was only 185. Um, we look at some other information, his recovery. So if you look at down the bottom here, he recovered 41% in a minute, which is phenomenal. Mm. He recovered 59% in two minutes. What I look for in the first minute is a minimum of 12 to 15%. He recovered 41%. He's nearly that's three some drop. Percent. Yeah, that's some drop. Second minute, he's 59%. I'm looking for a 30% recovery. He's double that. Mm. You know, so this is a this is a train. This guy's a runner, actually. I should have I can pull up an MMA athlete. Um, he is a runs a, a two fifty marathon comfortably. He's in his forties now, but he, he he's a really well conditioned athlete, and he's someone that's worked with me for years and and based a lot on, on heart rate training. Um, mm. his training zones. So when you do a test, you'd be given training zones. So these would be his training zones. So you can see how conditioned he is. If we work backwards, his max heart rate's one eighty five. His threshold or the high end of his moderate zone is going to be 166 so he's within 20 beats he's very very efficient again very me understanding yeah. the numbers he's running 15 kilometers an hour on a four percent gradient when he turns on aerobic so he's running sub four minute kilometers aerobically hmm. you know like it's it's some really really superior data the zones which we we can co cover now if you want do you want to go into that what, what they mean yeah we, we had a couple of questions around um you know how many times a week should you be training in the green zone why should i be training in the yellow zone etc yeah so if it links in nicely sean let's do that now right so let me just go through the data first so you have to understand the principles of energy systems before you understand heart rate zones yeah. so if you get a heart rate monitor and don't get a test done your data is going to be inaccurate. Yeah. If you get a test done and don't use your training zones, your data, your training is going to be inaccurate. So the best way to do it, and it's not just self-promoting here, like if you want to get a test done to identify thresholds with anybody, that's fine because you're going to benefit from it. Mm. So when you get tested, you get thresholds identified. So what a threshold is, we look at it as an anaerobic threshold. It's when your body changes from an aerobic energy system to an anaerobic energy system. So aerobic, it's in the name, is when the body performs with oxygen, so air. When you perform aerobically as a human, you're efficient, you're durable, you don't break down, you don't produce a lot of byproduct, you're pretty much using oxygen the whole time, your calorie expenditure is relatively low, so you're burning the majority of your calories from stored fat. When you turn anaerobic, and the reason you turn anaerobic is because the energy demand exceeds the oxygen deliverance. The body cannot create energy with oxygen anymore. 
So it starts to use glycogen, which is glucose, which is carbohydrate. So they're just different terms. They all mean the same thing. Carbohydrate broken down to glucose stored as glycogen in the liver and in the muscles. Now, when we perform anaerobically, we're inefficient. You can't argue with that. There's no denying we're inefficient. We're inefficient because yeah. we're not using oxygen. We're using an energy supply that's going to run out. So the average human has 80,000 calories available from stored fat. The average human has 2,000 calories available from glycogen. So there's a massive difference in energy de demand supply. You're going to run out of the fuel, but the big thing is you're going to create byproduct. Now that byproduct is lactic acid. Lactic acid gets a bad rap. Lactic acid isn't this evil product that causes us to break down. It's the body's reaction to lactic acid. So when the acidity of the blood gets too high, a number of things is going to happen. We're going to start to exhale more. We're going to blow off more carbon dioxide. We're going to develop oxygen death, and that's one of the real big factors why we can't perform. Now, the mm -hmm. body's reaction to that lactic acid accumulation or high acidity within the blood is to release hydrogen ions into the bloodstream, which is going to slow contraction and expansion of muscle down. You're more susceptible to injury, cramp, fatigue, and that driving home or that factor that you're in oxygen death, your body is going to force you to slow down. You have to remember as well, your heart's a muscle. And if your heart starts to be forced to slow down because of the contraction and expansion, the blood deliverance is going to slow down, which means the oxygen deliverance is going to slow down, which means you're going to turn or perform or stay anaerobic. Mm. So we can't perform anaerobically endlessly. It, mm. It's just impossible to do. So this whole theory, go hard or go home, you have to keep pushing, you always need to stay in red zone. Excuse the French, it's bullshit. And it's one of the main reasons people fatigue, overtrain, get injured, don't adapt, is yep. because this whole concept that we have to go hard, 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 hard. So one of my hardest job is to get people to slow down. Mm -hmm. And mainly, not mainly, but a lot of your MMA slash combat athletes are a nightmare for it. You know, like I've sat I in know. rooms with athletes who I won't name and coaches who I won't name, but both who are extremely famous and trying to drive home the fact that you need to lower your intensities. So let me just pull this um, data back up so we can have a look at it again, now that we spoke a bit more regarding t the actual training zones and what they mean. Can you see that? I do, yeah. So if we look at the left-hand side of the screen, low zone. So this client is uh, 63 to 141 is his low zone. So you have to remember this is this fella's zones uniquely. So he can perform up to 12 kilometers an hour, because that's 141, inclined 3%, 100% aerobically, 100% calories are coming from stored fat, which is phenomenal, like super efficient. Mm. So he can do all his low intensity work, mm. i.e. warm up, cool down, or active recovery, or slow runs up to heart rate 141, which is it's just amazing. So this is where I would get him to do the likes of warm up, cool down, or recovery runs. His green zone. 141 to 166. This is where he is going to perform optimally for a long distance. So this is his 10, 12, 15, 18 marathon paces. He is going to be in this zone. His calories are majority coming from fat. However, I'm sure people have heard of aerobic glycolysis. There will be a bit of glycogen getting used here, but still predominantly calories are coming from stored fat. Mm -hmm. So when we want someone to do a long run, we want them to do it aerobically. There is no point in doing your long run anaerobically because that's not the objective. The objective is to do it aerobically. So not to put the body under any stress, keep the body using oxygen, work on our breathing pattern, work on how the foot lands or the strike in terms of um, gait, how, how we're going to run. And we want you to be really, really comfortable on them run. If you go and do a long run anaerobically, your body is going to be in stress yeah. and there's no adaption. So when we perform in our yellow and red zone, both of them would be anaerobic. So yellow would be tempo, red would be interval. So tempo as an example is anything longer than 60 seconds. So you, mm -hmm. I program in like three minutes, five minutes, eight minutes, 12 minutes in yellow. And then red is gonna be anything less than 60 seconds. So this is interval. So mm -hmm. people talk to me about intervals. I did an eight minute interval. You didn't do an eight minute interval. You did an eight minute tempo. You can't do an eight minute interval no. if you're performing max. 90% plus heart rate, yeah, it's impossible. Yeah, like yeah, absolutely flat out because each different zone has a different principle or a different training point. So yeah. your low zone is going to be recovery. One of the really big points with low zone is it increases stroke volume. Stroke volume is the content of blood that leaves the heart in one beat. Mm -hmm. If we get more blood to leave, we get more oxygen to leave. We mm -hmm. get more oxygen delivered to the working muscles, 
we're more efficient. Yeah. So low zone is really, really important. Now, a lot of athletes will come in and their low zones won't be as high as this fella's. So they find it impossible to do, which is fine. And I understand that's fine. We do their warm up there and then I get them to do their long runs in green. Yeah. But they have to stay in green. Like time and time again, you're told, I can't do this, Sean. I can't get my heart rate down. And then you ask them what pace they run. They're like, oh, I'm running sub five minute kilometers. I'm like, yeah, what are you, well, running? Yeah. Yeah, what are you yeah. running a sub five minute kilometer on a long yeah. run? Yeah. So it's a lot of mental. You have to train the mind as well to realize what you're doing. So if you're always anaerobic and you're always going yellow and red, your body will never adapt because you're always in a state of stress. Mm -hmm. So you have to go slow to go fast. Mm -hmm. And I know yeah. it's hard to get the head around. You'll also burn more calories from stored fat when we're in green. Yeah. Now I'm not saying, and this, it's actually a bit of a buzz at the moment, um, fat adaption or low steady state aerobic training, or I'm going to go and do a fasted run. But if you do a fasted run and you do it anaerobically, you're not burning fat you're burning glycogen or glucose which is stored from the meals that we've eaten yeah. previously yeah so it, it's not going to do anything it's a bit of a cash 22. there was a there was a good question came in sean actually which is linked directly to this and it's actually a pal of mine who's just trying to get back getting fit again bought himself a heart rate monitor is trying to do a bit of running but every time he starts off two or three minutes into the run he's spiking into his red zone uh, and he can't continue so his question was his question was you know what do I do? I can't I can't run any slower now. In fairness, he hasn't been training in, in a long time. Uh, he's put on a bit of weight, and now he's just getting back up off the couch. So running for him at the moment is just too hard for him. So what does he need to do in order to to get the best out of of his training? Right. So the first question I was asked is: Is that a generic red zone? Is he just using a formula? Because if he's just using a formula, which is standard two twenty minus your age multiplied by that. a certain percentage, yeah. yeah. They're very inaccurate. And I'll give you two really, really simple examples on this. And it answers a couple of questions that I've seen that were coming in on your story. So use me and my brother as an example. We're both from the same mother and father. Mm -hmm. Genetically, we should be theoretically the same. Mm -hmm. We have different sports. He's a competitive butterfly swimmer, unbelievable swimmer. He'll get his heart rate up about 210 when he's racing. Okay, he's older than me. So 210, he's in his 30s. So that whole theory straight away is gone. Me, yeah. on the other hand, I struggle to get my heart rate over 160. Struggle. I just, I can't do it. Like last night, uh, John was uh, sent me two questions last night. I went and did tempo and interval sprints or hill sprints last night. My heart rate didn't get over 163, 164. Like, and I was flat out uphills. I just couldn't do it. So if both of us were to use that 220 minus your age formula, they would be both completely wrong. Yeah. So, Make sure like you're not just using that theoretical formula. That's number one, because you may you mightn't be red. You could be green, you yeah. could be yellow. I doubt you're in red, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. Secondly, unfortunately, this is something that takes time. You can't just get a quick fix. And I'm a prime example for it. I don't do a lot of running, but since lockdown has come in, I've really got into my running and I'm really enjoying it. And I cannot break the four minute kilometer mark. And it's frustrating me so much like last night i was so annoyed about it i'm only running about five weeks you mm. know and I, I i'm like i have to practice what i preach but i just want to break that but now i know i need to start to integrate some intervals i know i need to start to integrate some longer slower runs so the last every second day for the last six days i've done tempos and i can't break the four minute kilometer so tomorrow i'm going to do a long steady state 5k keep my my kilometers down below or about five minute kilometers two days later i'll do some interval training and then i'm going to attempt it again so i'm looking at hitting each discipline in order to adapt okay. so yeah. keep coming back to your friend's question is he going off too hard because he has this preconceived idea that he should be able to do this because he's done it in the past so he has to look at a number of different factors he's gained a bit of weight you said so yeah he's no longer as efficient as he used to be the more weight you have the more demand for oxygen to that body weight, the mm -hmm. harder the heart's going to have to work. So mm -hmm. let's look at let's look at doing it together. Let's say, okay, I'm going to start to drop a bit of weight. If I drop a bit of weight, my heart rate is going to reduce because the demand for oxygen or blood deliverance to all weight is going to reduce. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Change it up as well. Don't just do the same run all the time. So go, okay. So today is going to be extremely difficult. I'm going to go to a football field. 
and I'm gonna run as fast as I can one length of the field. I'm gonna walk the whole way back, I'm gonna repeat it. So the effort's probably gonna be 10 or 12 seconds. That's your interval day. Do as many as you can with good recovery. That's that day done. Next day, you're gonna go for a walk slash jog. So if you find your heart rate's going too high because your pace is too high, lower the intensity. And if that means you have to go at a pace that you find uncomfortable or not ashamed, but you're thinking, I can run faster than this. But if you're going into red and you cannot perform, you're running too hard, you're running yeah. too high, you're, you're anaerobic. So we need to start to go out. Or the alternative is get a bike. Yeah. Go off on a go off on a lower, like so ther theoretically your heart rate's gonna be lower on a bike than it is on a run because you're sitting down for starters. So your heart doesn't need to pump as high. Yeah. So there's, there's lots of different things you can do, but repeating the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is the first sign of madness. But yeah. it's also, you're not going to go anywhere because you're just doing the same thing to your body. And this is something that I see a lot is athletes will come in and go, oh, I'm not, uh, my times aren't getting any better. I'm not getting any fitter, but I feel a bit better. Feeling better and performing better are two different things. Mm -hmm. What you're learning to do if you're always in yellow and red is you're learning to deal with fatigue or byproduct production associated with anaerobic. You're not actually getting better. What makes you get better is adaption, which means threshold adaption. Yeah. So mixing up all the different types of running, easy, easy walk slash jog, easy jog, uncomfortable runs, that kind of tempo stuff where you're greater than 60 seconds up to eight or 12 minutes and then them really uncomfortable intervals but leaving your house with a clear plan every day is into what session you're doing i use yeah. my front door as a marker when i walk out i go okay what's the point what's the point of this session is it aerobic or is it anaerobic and when i know that then i know exactly what i'm going to do yeah. and even it means the intensity of session is low yeah. or if the intensity of session is high you, yeah. you just don't repeat the same thing over and over again if it's pushing it up yeah. but just yeah. to keep i know it, it keeps going off the point but I would make sure you're trying, I wouldn't be overly concerned about your heart rate in red if you haven't got tested. I would change up the intensities rather than just doing the same repeated effort. Mm -hmm. Maybe incorporate some bike work, but also be patient. Yeah. Be patient is, is one of the biggest things I can say. And this is when, when it clicks, you'll, you'll really start to notice when you put a bit of effort in, when you're on your low, slow stuff, work on that breathing, work on yeah. that stride. Yeah. And then in four to six weeks time, you'll be running faster for less effort. Yeah. Yeah. That's when you know it's worked. Yeah. And that's the beauty of walking, Sean, isn't it? For people who are getting back into, into training, maybe you have been sedentary for a couple of years yeah. through whatever reasons. Um, and you touched on the, the culture of go hard and go home. And many people are trying to get back into fitness, going to boot camps, go hard, go home culture, getting totally wrecked, burnt out not able to go back to it because they feel that that's how you have to get fit. It's probably counterproductive in the long run. In fact, it is counterproductive in the long run. What's your opinion there? Yeah, like one of the, one of the big things I like it, one of the ones I tend to always link this back to is a high stressful position in work and they go and do a spin class, yes. you know, so they come from a high stress in work, they go in, they do high stress in yeah. exercise. They're probably high they stress people, you know? Yeah, so like the parasympathetic, sympathetic nervous system never gets a rest. It's mm -hmm. always under consistent pressure, 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 yeah. pressure. Yeah. And they worry why they're, they're not losing weight or they concern why they're not losing weight. Remember when we're spinning, we're anaerobic, calories yeah. are coming from glucose. We're going to yeah. go home and probably have a carbohydrate containing meal. And you're under complete stress, 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 stress. So you need yeah. to bring in that lower intensity stuff. So if you, one of the things I'll always do with my combat sport athletes is we would, depending on, the level of professionalism, depending on the plan session, the event, the, where we are in the camp, this type of thing, we'll, we will vary how many green sessions we'll do a week. And mm. it will vary for the athlete as well. So, for example, let's use your friend there. We, I'm probably going to throw it out there that he has a, a poor aerobic capacity. He is turning anaerobic really, really early. Yeah. So we don't necessarily need him to be doing four interval sessions a week. Well, what's the benefit of that? We need him to bring in some green zone training, which is gonna allow for adaption, but we'll also allow him to do some yellow and red training in yeah. order to create the stimulus to grow the threshold. Yeah. Let me get the threshold up on the screen here. This will make more sense. Yeah, good visual this. of that would be good, yeah. So if we look at this graph here, 
So this green graph, this would have been, this is a great example. So if you, if I bring this green line to here, I can't bring it back, I'll bring the blue line back first. So this is, this is a progressional test actually. So this is where his initial data was when he would have started working with us first. I put two tests on top of each other here. Okay. And what he's done is he's moved his threshold on yeah. by performing based on, on heart rate zone. So he has grown his green vertical line. His threshold has gone up by about, it's gone up six minutes. It's gone up four kilometers. Now this is over a, a, a 12 or 16 week camp, you know, like sure, this yeah, yeah. a good athlete. But what we're looking to do is we're looking to push that green line on as far as we can. And how we do that is by stimulation in yellow and red, as well as allowing long, slow runs in order to adapt. Mm. If you're always yellow and red, there's no adaption. There's just no, stress. Just stress, yeah. So he's probably pretty hard on himself. He's probably had a, a good background in performance and he probably thinks he should be able to go out and do this. But he just needs to overview, be a critical evaluator, look at your own training from above. Don't look at it from the point of view, I need to go hard, hard, hard. Like for my own self, talking about practice, what I preach, I know this is going to take time. I'm only running five weeks. Now don't yeah. get me wrong, look, I have, a, I have a really good level of fitness and it's probably like people are like, what, you're running 401 kilometers and you think that's bad. Yeah, it does because I have a high level that I want to achieve. I know in the grander scheme of things, it's pretty impressive. But I have to step back and overview what stimulates me and what 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 is green for me. Like, lucky yeah. enough, I've tested. All my training is based on heart rate. I know exactly where I am, every zone I need to be in. My intervals are dictated by recovery. Yeah, look, I have the I have the benefit of of, of testing any time I want. But it's about being that critique of you, being that critical of your own training to say, okay, I know I want to go on a hard run today, yeah. but I know. Yeah, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do a long, easy walk slash jog. I'm going to get an extra bit of sleep today. I'm going to drink more water. I'm going to have more greens on your aerobic days, you know, that type mm. of stuff. And one of the yeah. things that it ties in nicely is people neglect to sleep or rest. Yeah. Like how many people get seven plus hours of night sleep, professional athletes, or people that are striving to run a sub three hour marathon or striving to win a medal in, in kickboxing championship. You look at sleep, it's probably one of the most neglected things, you know, Absolutely. Like yeah. we adapt when we sleep, we recover when we sleep, we grow yeah. when we sleep, yeah. you know, like a lecturer of mine in college actually said sleep is the training. If you're yeah. not sleeping, your training is a total waste of time. So yeah. everything, everything takes place as you're, as you're, uh, as you're sleeping. He actually said sleeping is the training part. <laughs> so I thought it was Even, interesting. There's studies on weight loss coming out now about it as well. Like if like one of the most overlooked attributes in weight loss is sleep deprivation. Yeah. yeah. Or like just not getting enough. And it's one of the things by working with athletes, I would do a lot of work with weight loss. And it's something that people don't credit themselves or they don't even they don't allow for downtime. In the mm. world that we live in, it's something like even as I say, read a book. Mm. Don't sit on your phone up until one minute before you go to sleep and then tell me that you struggle to fall asleep. Mm. You know, like sleep hygiene is, is so important or I can't sleep. When did you last have a cup of coffee? Oh, about three hours, two hours before I went to bed. Well, that's yeah, going to yeah, keep yeah. you awake. Blood sugar balancing. I know we're getting off topic. Blood sugar balancing is, is something that causes people to wake yeah. consistently through the yeah. night because yeah. the production of cortisol when the blood sugar gets too low. And yeah, like, it wakes you up uh, looking, for a feed, looking for a feed, yeah. Yeah, that, that could, that's a whole different ball game. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a topic in itself, but it is. It's it that the the long, slow, steady stuff is crucial to performance, but it takes discipline to do. Yeah, for sure. I think that kind of answers one of the other questions that came in. Uh, came in from a paddler actually. You're starting from a low base of fitness. How do you use heart rate data? with dynamic benchmarks. That kind of covers that nicely, I think, doesn't it? Just getting back into fitness training and stuff. Yeah, but track it. Track yeah. it and be proud. Like, uh, I was talking to my brother. My brother lives lives abroad, but I'm, I'm coaching him from home. So when he was home last time, we tested him, and then I send his data to a coach, and yeah. um, his the coach will program for him. It's the coach I use over here. And he said he looks back at the paces that he was running when he started to run six or eight months ago and can't believe how slow he was. Mm. But he said that to me. He was giving me the advice yesterday on the phone. He said, look, you can look back on these times in six or eight weeks and say, Jenny, you, you've come on a long way, you know? So yeah, yeah. benchmark everything, track it all. Don't be embarrassed or ashamed to go on slow runs, even if it means walks. 
Yeah. But integrate as much variability as you can. Don't just do the same thing over again. Yeah. Bring in hill sprints, bring in tempos, bring in kilometer efforts, bring yeah. in 5K yeah. steady state. You know, yeah. like change your training so there's always a stimulus. Yeah. Repeat the same thing, you'll get the same result. Yeah, 100%. I think it's, it's, a, good, it's a good point that you make about like your, uh, your ego when you're out doing kind of that low intensity steady state. I was on the green about two weeks ago doing a very casual, a very light jog. And I was lapped twice by somebody who was probably in their 60s, maybe early 70s. And there's a little bit in me that says, come on, man, you, need gonna, you can't let this happen. You're going to have to speed chase, up. Chase him yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's an interesting one about, about ego and staying disciplined for your, for your low intensity. It is, and even more so, not more so for me, but because it's my job to tell people how to do it. Yeah. I'm like, I should be able to do this, but I'm like, no, listen to what you say, you know, or I was talking yeah. to a couple of the athletes I work with over the few days and they're like, I'm so happy you're doing tempos and intervals because they know, the, I know the pain. Yeah, I put them yeah, through. yeah, exactly, so, exactly. They're yeah. like, it, it's a bit of feedback for you. Yeah. Know, it's all, it's all good. It's all good. Listen, would two people of the same age possibly have different different max heart rates and if so why that came in from yeah. a taekwondo taekwondo fighter absolutely and this is something that i encounter quite a lot with the likes of runners or cyclists because they train in par pairs or partners or anything like that um we're all completely different from completely different backgrounds and we've touched on a lot of points so did the guy that you're comparing your heart rate to have 10 hours sleep and you had six How, what's his diet consistent of what's his genetic background what's yeah. the history of heart problems in his family or What's he being genetically pre-exposed to? Like, absolutely. And this is why I say to people, you cannot base your heart rate training zones off somebody that's got tested because you will have different heart rates. Yeah, for so sure. Do not be worried in any way, shape, or form if you have a higher or lower heart rate than someone you consider to be extremely fit or who you aspire to be like. Mm -hmm. You're completely two different people. And um, again, I know we're, I'm not the exact same age as my brother, but we are genetically pre-exposed to the same genes but we've completely different heart rates and we'd both be healthy but I, I don't know to be honest as to why we have different heart rates but we do have different heart rates are they the same weight are they the same age you know these are the things that we need to always yeah. look sorry we know they're the same age are they the same weight are they the same height mm. sleep everything there's so many different factors into it but you will definitely have different heart rates without a shadow of a doubt yeah, yeah, I think that's I think that's pretty obvious. Um, a great question came in, and this is this is something that's overlooked by coaches. I think a lot. This was sent in by a young athlete, actually. And the question was, how intense should your warm up be? What is the main? Like, so this would be this would be a kickboxing, um, a young kickboxing athlete on a development program, um, probably doing a standard kickboxing class, um probably working on technique, a little bit of sparring and, and, and stuff. But obviously, you know, with sparring, you're going to be spiking your heart rate up pretty consistently, probably into the into the uh, 80, 80%, 90% of max heart rate. But it's it's an interesting one. Um, I suppose it's interesting from the point of view as to how coaches actually structure their their classes or their sessions. Are they too hard? Can like, they I be think, too hard like, at the start? I think we'll be able to tie in together with this nicely. You'd have the experience as a coach on this. But... I'm looking at it from a, a principal perspective. So what is the objective of a warm-up? So it's in the name. It's, in, it's, it's to warm you up. It's to get you fluid. It's to get you mobile. It's to get your joints active. It's to get your muscles warmed up. Prime, so yeah. again, using an example of running, I will do 10 minutes of dynamic stretching before I leave the house. You know, so movement of my hips, movement of hamstrings, quads, yeah. glutes, everything like that, going through the theory. So my own background would be Muay Thai in terms of my own sport. So if I was to do Muay Thai, I'd do upper body, lower body, shadow boxing, you know, like going through the motions of, of what your session is going to be. Mm. Now, you're never going to replicate what your session is going to be if you're sparring, but you want to be make sure that you're warmed up, you're stretched, your muscles are ready. Yeah. Do you have to go into your red zone? No. But... Like I've been in sessions where people are getting you to do 20 meter max sprints, you know, like, is there a need for that? Are you going to pull a hamstring? <laughs> like yeah, what's, yeah. what's the premises you're in? Are you, have you yeah. done your dynamic stretching? Have you done your yeah. shadow boxing? Yeah. But you, you probably would lean on this a bit better, John, in terms of your knowledge, but I would just look at what's the principles of, of, of a warm up. And if you know yourself that you've done your stretching, your mobility work, 
you feel like you're moving around, maybe a light sweat is starting to go on, and then your coach is going to push you through whatever. I mean, you might consider it too hard. You're ready for that. That, that The warm-up is probably part of your session more so yeah. at that point. Yeah, pretty much. I think from my point of view, very quickly, I think the less experienced the coach is, the harder the warm-up session is. I think sometimes a lot of the warm-ups, and even the class itself, if there's a lack of technical knowledge, that gap is kind of filled with really intense exercise um, for no apparent reason than just it's really easy to tell someone to do something as hard and as fast as they possibly can. A burpee. Yeah, keep going until I say stop. Oh, my coach is so hard, you know, he's so great. Mm. Like, two, 10 minutes of burpees, you know, and it's all, it's all nonsense. Um, mm. But I think it boils back to that culture of go hard or go home. If, if the warm-up isn't tough, well, then it's not a training session, this type of mindset, which is really ridiculous. It's, it's, it's crap. I, I remember in my early days when I was competing, traveling out to another club to, to a very well-established coach just to get some spars off their fighters and did a warm-up session that incorporated the sprints the full length of the hall, nearly from the get-go to a point that I was actually feeling sick and I had to go out to the toilet to, uh, to try to get sick before the session even started. And, and the result of that is I remember that part of the class really well because it was awful and I forget the rest of it. The rest of it was yeah. just a blur. I think I might have just tried to survive for the rest of that class. And I think, Sean, you're right. Your warm-up is, is exactly that. It's to prime you for the body of the main body of the session. It's to get blood into the muscles, to get oxygen into the blood, to get your head kind of leveled off and ready for the training session and uh, most importantly to interact with your peers in the class socialize and see how everyone's getting on you know so hopefully that answers that question for that young lad um, uh, an aspiring kickboxer you might see him in the on the world stage sooner i think what we need to obviously say to him john as well is if he we don't want him to go up to his coach and say you're doing this wrong no but if it means you need to get there five or ten minutes earlier and you need to go through your own warm-up or your dynamic stretching or your mobility yeah. work and catch up with your friends, that's fine. And then if you, look, you, you can only do what your coach is doing. If you're only a young aspiring kickboxer, you're obviously going to follow his lead. But yeah. just... I think he's all right. His coach is his brother, so he can say what he likes to him. Okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, th I think, anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's all right then. How important are green zone sessions? How many should you be doing a week? I think we touched on that earlier. That's from an MLA. Uh, yeah, but Minnesota just to West. come back to it, they're absolutely yeah. vital. 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 I cannot stress enough the importance yeah. of green zone. Now, I hope she's listening because every time she posts up on Instagram and she trains hard, she trains too hard. Everything is balls to the wall. Everything yeah. is sprints. Everything is plyometrics. Everything is throwing things around. At, you know, at the, the hardest that she can go. So it's a great question. I hope I hope she's listening in. I'm sure she will be. They're, they're very, very important. Female athletes as well, really important. Really, really important. And again, a couple of your, your well, well, well-known fighters I've worked with. And um, recently enough, um, I sat down with her and her coach, who are both really well-known due to the loss of her cycle. Mm. And trying to drive home that she's training three times a day and yep. they're all yellow or red zone and she can't understand why she's getting injured and why her cycle is so messed up and everything like that and it's it's just it's just dangerous you know stress, the level stress, of stress, the intensity yeah. that they cause that yeah. they put on their body especially as a young female you need to be really really aware of it that yep. you, you allow for and listen to your body don't put yourself under so much stress all the time you know yep. let them green zones come in and yep. Don't be so hard on yourself if it means that you have to miss a session and go yeah. for a walk that day. Get a bit more sleep and just, yeah. just be aware. Of what no, no adaptation. If you're constantly under stress, there's no, no. improvement. It's all, it's all, it's all aggressive. Yeah. Um, another question in from a young athlete. Um, she says, if your heart, if you're a fit athlete, what should your heart rate be right after an intense or a normal spar? So it kind of, it kind of depends, doesn't it, Sean? Yeah. Like it's there's, there's nothing you it shouldn't it shouldn't be anything it should be it should be recovering that's what it should be it should be dropping yeah uh, so it depends on what it's spiked to like if I said to you it should be at the one forties and your max heart rate's two oh eight you're yeah. you're never gonna do that you know so yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it's individualized what it should be it should be dropping and I know that's not the answer that you probably want to hear but you know after an intense spar if it's been a really high level spar, you're under pressure, you're giving as much as you're getting, there's going to be adrenaline, heart rate's going to be up. We just want to make sure post spar that you are recovering, that the heart rate is decreasing at, at, a, at a reasonable level, you know, yeah. that it, it's dropping off. And yeah. depending yeah. on, are you stagnant, are you moving, are your hands up, are your hands down, are you breathing? 
what are you doing and then look look at how the heart rate but hopefully it's it's yeah. decreasing it shouldn't yeah. necessarily be anything unless i knew what your numbers were you yeah know? exactly that was one of the key points i took away from you when lauren did testing with you five or six years ago when we went san sebastian to the european championships we knew that our her um her heart rate would drop significantly on the one minute break and that was something that we never really factored in at the time probably never really fully understood but took away from that session with you that she actually has the capacity to go balls to the walls for three rounds here and did so and was actually one of those championships that she she, she went through the competitors like a hot knife through butter just through pure intensity knowing that she would after the the minute break at the round will be ready to go again. Yeah, it's a massive psychological boost for, for an huge. athlete and bring, bringing it back huge. to that Muay Thai fighters. Yeah. But, but if you know that you can... So if you've done your training right, you've done your tempo sessions where you've put yourself under pressure for three or five minute rounds, you're used yeah. to dealing with that anaerobic byproduct, and you know you're going to recover within a minute, you yeah. can go balls to the yeah. wall for, for each round. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I remember saying to her on the last round, going back in, I said, you're probably at about 130 now. I said, just go at her. You know, yeah, she went, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and went at her, you know, and won that championship pretty easy. So yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a really interesting one. This is a really good question, Sean. Um, my heart rate tells me I'm doing things well, but how do you know if you're doing things wrong? Like, can your readouts tell you you've got health problems? That's a really thought out question. Yeah, so the, like, <clears throat> at the end of the day, like my phone and my watch tell me I'm doing great. It's a, uh, yeah. it's, it's, <laughs> it's, what is the word I'm looking for? It's, it's to give you confidence. It's, it's to give you a push, you know, well done, yeah. keep going. And you're doing great. Yeah, that's good. You know what I mean? I know it helps me saying, look, keep up the great work. You're nearly there, whatever you set your target. Can it tell you that something's wrong? I don't think an app is going to tell you something's wrong. However, I do think if you can read your data, and it's consistent. Let's pull up this as an example again. Um, I know it's not going to be the exactly same as what you have, mm. but let's look at the client's blue line on this graph. So his blue line is his heart rate. Yeah, I'm interested to see that spike there. Just that, was it four? Is that the yeah, time, time across the bottom? What that, yeah. So what that spike is, at four minutes, he went from walk to jog. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he jogged up. So let's just say you're looking at your data and you can track your heart rate. And let's just use these numbers as an example. You're running a five minute kilometer, so your average heart rate's 141, and you're running, running. And then there's a minute where there's a couple of spikes where it's at 160 or 170, and then it's back down. Yeah. You know, like something's wrong. So your phone or your watch isn't necessarily going to tell you that you're, something's wrong with your heart, but looking at your data posts should give you an indication if, if your heart rate's performing well or mm. using your recovery. If your heart rate doesn't recover after your exercise, you're in trouble. Yeah. You know, so looking at learning- What's that the signs of, Sean? What's that the general signs of, if you think like, and how long, like if my heart rate is still at like say- It could be a blockage of some description, you know what I mean? There okay. could be some- yeah. Again, it depends on what you, you peaked at. You know, so mm. let's just use 170 as now. You peaked at 170 and two minutes later, it's still at 170, there's an issue. You know, yeah. like you yeah. want to be down a minimum of 10 to 12 percent within a minute yeah easy. And, and then it continues to drop now in testing um i don't know you've probably seen it john i got a lovely uh text not too long ago off a girl who basically credited me for saving her life um yep. she that. had she done a test with me and like that them spikes were more regular than often and i just wasn't happy so i stopped the test changed the monitor changed the pickup and i just wasn't happy and she was really she was really clued in about it she's like look that's no problem and in the past, I've had people go absolutely crazy at me for stopping the test. I had a girl before who um, demanded a refund, and I gave her a refund. And it turned out that she got a heart operation within 24 hours because her husband had, had pushed her to, to get an exam done. She got into the, the cardiology department in a hospital, and they let's say they were open until 6 o'clock. They said uh, she got in there at 10 to 6. They said, you're going nowhere. You're getting treated in the morning. Wow. So she had a, a three-way blockage in her heart. So um, yeah, the girl, what it was, was there was a lot of irregularity and it, like she went to her GP and her GP told her it was dehydration. Like I just couldn't believe it. And then she went to the cardiologist and he got her to do various different things. And he said, no, look, it looks okay. But her brother was involved in some form of cardiology and he got her um, one of these testing units where she can do an ECG when she's out running. Yeah, and she'd done an ECG every 15 minutes on a long run and, and they figured out that there was some um, a fibrillation blockage in her heart and she has to just get a, a very simple procedure done 
um, it should it should be no issue and, and she can go back running, you know. But she said, like, the likes of that, it's, it's a regularity is what's important rather than what yeah. number it gets to or whatever. Looking for irregularities in a consistent heart rate, if it's dropping and spiking, that's an issue, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. So a consistent rise and consistent fall is pretty normal to look out for. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Another one about recovery, Sean. How can I measure my recovery after, say, I do two minutes of high intensity interval training? So thirty seconds on, fifteen seconds off for a round. I do, I do hit one ninety six BPM. What should I be after a minute's rest? So we think, what's that? So if we like let like just roughly example, we want them to be down twelve yeah. percent. So even if they were down ten percent, they're gonna be down in the one seventies, you know, twelve percent even like into yeah. the one sixty. You're looking for about a twelve minimum of twelve is what what's their background? Uh taekwondo. Yeah, you'd be looking for a fifteen percent plus then, you know. Mm. So mm. let me just do that real quickly. Um yeah, like it's but they don't have do they have a heart rate monitor? Yep. Okay, I don't know so, what type now. I don't know what type. So 29 beats off that. 196 minus 29. So yeah, you're looking to be into the 160s realistically, you yeah. know, within a minute. Yeah. Um, but yeah. are they taking, so the way they did 13, 30 on, 15 off, are they doing 13 on, 15 off, three rounds and then testing recovery? I presume so. I presume the test is in between rounds. So you do 30 on, 15 off. And then there's a minute rest to, to replicate the minute break in between rounds. So it might okay, be that. Yeah. Yeah, you're looking, yeah, we're looking to get them down into the 160s, realistically, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, anything more than that's a bonus. Anything higher than that, don't be overly worried or concerned about. Like yeah. high 160s, yeah. early 170s, I'd be yeah. happy with it. Cool. Question about the bleed test. The old, the old school bleed test was done in school for the GA team, but we never used heart rate monitors. Is that a bad thing? So I suppose you're kind of comparing bleed tests or... Multi, uh, multi-stage multi fitness tests, I presume, is what they were doing uh, against heart rate monitors or testing with heart rate monitors. They're not really comparable, really. No. Like a bleep test is, it's not monitored on heart rate, it's, it's a fitness it's distance, test. It, yeah, yeah. it works a lot more for field sports, you know, they, they find it more difficult to do um, individual VO2 testing, which because I can understand, numbers, you yeah. panel of 20 or 30 players. You know, so the likes of your shuttle runs, your bleep tests and stuff. I actually have a, a friend of mine who's putting a thesis forward regarding the comparability of bleep tests to VO2. So we tested all these, I tested a yeah. lot of people from VO2 yeah. and yeah. then he did a bleep test with them all. How so, did it turn out? Did he get results yeah, yet? Ha hasn't finished it yet. He's, he's okay. only in the process of finishing it up. So really interesting to see. Yeah, see it would be interesting. With, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really interesting. So to answer the question, is it a good thing or a bad thing? No, it, it's neither. It, they're, just, they're just not the same, you know? Yeah, yeah, true, yeah. Um. Okay, as a coach, maybe this is, I don't know if this is towards me. As a coach, Sean, what do the results of a VO2 test tell you? How do you know what to do with, with your guys and how does it benefit them in the long run? I think we covered that pretty well. Going to start doing more of this when we're back at it. And I would absolutely encourage all athletes and all coaches to get involved and get tested because without knowing the actual stats and the data, you're effectively training in the dark. You don't know if you're overtraining, undertraining, what you're going, how are you meant to reach a goal if you don't know what your baseline is, where you're starting from. So it tells you everything, um, to be honest. Um, Sean, what do you it, think? Yeah, like it gives it get the inside information. As you said, you're training yeah. the deck, you're training blind without it. Yeah. Um, I think slowly but surely, breaking down a combat athlete or an MMA athlete, the attribute of fitness is, is coming more and more prevalent. And this will give us the inside track on a lot of things, lung function, breathing, heart rate, recovery, yeah. ability. We yeah. use a lot of the data for, for weight cutting as well. I don't think we've done as much with yourself, John, but one of the things that it will give us again, I'll, I'll share the screen. If we look at um, the, the lower numbers here on the heart rate zone, so we can tell you exactly how many calories you're expelling based on heart rate. Yep. So in order for the human body to burn a single calorie, you must consume 0.8 of a milliliter of oxygen. So the higher the VO2, the higher calorie expenditure. Mm -hmm. So if we know how much calories you're expelling and then you know what an average heart rate is, we can then actively work out what requirements are for the likes of your weight cuts. So it'll yeah, give us a, yeah. a bit more inside information. But it yeah. just gives you the inside track on your athlete, really. 
Yep, absolutely. And it's funny, it's if, if you're going to buy a car, you'll bring a mechanic with you. And what does the mechanic do? They lift the bonnet and they look inside to see exactly how the car is performing. And it's mm. the same. It's 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 the same analogy that you would you'd want to use with an athlete. You want to know exactly how they're performing, and what their ability to perform is um, as well. I suppose. Um, earlier on, Sean, you spoke about VO two being a potential kind of predictor of performance, um, and that anaerobic threshold being like the predictor of performance. Can you explain that a little bit more, maybe for us? So VO two as a number is. Um it's a number, basically. Uh, yeah. So say, say, say I get a score of, like, I'm super fit, I'm going to the World Championships, I've been training for two years for this big event, and I've scored with you 65 on a VO2 max test. What does that, what, what does that say in terms of my potential? And does that mean that I'm going to be fitter than everybody else that's there? Let's, let's use a, a second example. So you score a 65, I score a 58. Yeah but I have a higher threshold than you do and I have a better recovery than you do. So you're going to bore me every time, yeah. Which means I'm going to be able to perform at a higher intensity than you are. However, if we get your numbers and we start to train you smarter, you have potential to grow and perform better than I would. Yeah. So remember, aerobic capacity is, is or sorry, anaerobic. We turn anaerobic because we're in oxygen debt or we can't deliver oxygen quick enough. So if we have a higher volume of oxygen, it means we have a higher availability of oxygen, which is going to keep us aerobic, which means efficient for longer. So if we have a higher VO2 max, we have the potential to perform at a higher level. However, if we're neglecting the likes of our green zone work or not doing intervals or tempos, that type of stuff, we mightn't be able to do it. So it's not always that VO2 number that wins. There's lots mm. of different contributing factors. Mm. Mm. However, a lot of the time, if you have a high VO2, you're going to be performing very, very well. And just mm. off screen, before we came on here, before the recording, we were speaking about the um, health benefits of, of a VO2 max. And the we were talking about how many people with have died from the COVID-19 that would have a high VO2 max. And one of the relevant points in that as well, John, that I never spoke to you about it, is weight. So yeah. look at the, like if someone has obesity or, or weight issues, their VO2 is going to be really, really low mm. because it's volume of oxygen per kilo weight of body mass. Mm. So one of the biggest things that you can do for yourself to improve your VO2 max is to drop a bit of weight. And that's for more so not your athletes that are performing day in, day out. Like you spoke about your friend there who, who's coming back on, may put on a bit of timber over the time that he's taken off. Dropping weight will make you more efficient. Make you more efficient will make you run faster for longer, for less effort. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and that's the point on it. So yeah. VO2 is a marker of potential. However, untrained, it's not really going to do a lot for you. Like I've seen both scales of it. I've seen really high VO2 max where they perform really low. And mm. I've seen low VO2 maxes. Like when I say low, they're still scoring well, but like say high 40s, early 50s, but they're running some yeah. three hour marathons yeah, because yeah. They're, they're super disciplined in their training, like super disciplined. They understand recovery, sleep, they understand what needs to happen, they don't overdo yeah. it, they don't, you know, yeah. like it, it's something that you need to be aware yeah. of. And obviously endurance athletes will use the heart, their heart rate markers that are in and around or just below their anaerobic threshold as... as um, race pace or you know to set a pace for a long distance so they, they know they can hold that pace without getting fatigued yeah like so look at the marathon as an example it's a prime 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 yeah. thing to talk about like people giving out so you get someone in and they want to run a 330 marathon so 26 miles 42 kilometers 330 that means yeah. you have to run a five minute kilometer so then they speak to you about they're going out running 430s and wonder understand why they can't break the 330 mark by the 42 kilometers because you're yeah. running too fast at the start, which means you're anaerobic. Yeah. So you have to discipline, discipline, discipline. If you want to run a 330, you need to consistently run five minute kilometers for 42 yeah. kilometers. Yeah. It's not running 430s at the start and then run. You're not going to do it. So if you look at halfway on a marathon, even 12 miles into a marathon, you're 11, 12 miles in. You look at the amount of people that start to crumble because they go off too early and they yeah. turn anaerobic. Yeah. 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 So all the negative. Excuse me, all the negatives yeah. start to happen. Yeah, there's an, there's an amount of intelligence really when you're running long distance or even cycling long distance, which brings me to another question around cycling and um, the power to weight ratio, Sean. Do you want to tell us a little about how that's, um, I suppose, understanding power to weight ratio and how it's beneficial for cyclists? Okay, so when we do um, 
we do VO2 testing on a bike, we do it on a watt meter or we use a Le Mans powertrain or whatever. We have to measure wattage. So what we do is when we do VO2 testing as a run test, we'll give your heart rate zones and speed. But when we do it on a bike test, we'll give your heart rate zones and on power. So a prime example is, let's just say on January 1st, you turn anaerobic and you're producing 200 watts and your body weight is let me let's just use some simple numbers even though it's not relevant realistic 50 kilos so your ftp functional threshold power is done in watts per kilo so you're generating four watts per kilo weight of body mass when you turn anaerobic if you drop a bit of weight you're going to produce more power mm. so ftp relevance you drop a bit of weight you're going to produce more power output which means you're going to go faster yeah. So one of the things I see, and you probably don't see it a lot, John, but I see it as a tester, as a cyclist. A lot of cyclists or triathletes, as an example, will be carrying a bit of weight. But they come in and speak to you about their new 1,200 milligram wheels and their new carbon fiber frame. And I'm looking at them going, you've at least two stone to lose here, pal. You know, like think about what that's going to do for your power to weight ratio. Yeah, so yeah, you're yeah. going to be carrying less weight, which means you're going to perform faster. Your VO2 is going to go higher, which means you're going to have more oxygen availability, which means your threshold is going to go higher, which means you're going to be able to go faster for longer. Mm -hmm. So FTP or watts per kilo is about how much power you can generate and hold for a period of time. So if you drop a bit of weight and create a bit of power or use strength and conditioning to get your power up. So use that as an example. You're producing... Heart rate 160, your threshold, you're producing 200 watts. You do a 12 week SNC program and a heart rate 160, you're producing 235 watts. So you're going faster for less effort. Yeah. And, and that's what it boils down to, you know? Makes sense. So there's no no need to start shaving pieces off your wheels or. <laughs> oh, <laughs> looking, drop a bit of, the, Yeah, yeah. Drop a bit of weight. Like, I knew yeah. it. I, I, start, I did a bit of work with a guy a couple of years ago. And this isn't a word of a lie. He came to me at 110 kilos to do an Ironman. And he finished the Ironman at 110 kilos. And like, how do you train for an Ironman and not lose weight? Yeah. Because your diet Bizarre. is atrocious. You know, you're having, yeah. you're having I, this fellow was having four sachets of tailwind an hour, which had 50 grams of sugar in every single one of them. You know, or they go on the long spin and it turned out, and I've, I do a bit of work with him since and he's down a lot of weight. It turned out that whatever his watch told him he burned in calories, he thought he needed to eat back in. So oh. he got rid of, he got rid of, like 2,000 calories on a cycle. He's like, oh, well, I need to eat that now. And I'm like, well, well, what's the point? <laughs> you're, you're, you're trying to create a deficit and you're putting all the calories back into your body. You know, like, oh, just, it's yeah. beggar's belief. It, it Obviously, yeah. it's my job to understand it a lot more than other people, but yeah. some of the things I'm presented with, like that example of output, like if you're using exercise as a, as a deficit creator, you don't bring the calories back on that you've just burned or there's yeah. no deficit. Yeah, if yeah. you find that exercise is taking its toll on you from an energy perspective, what I would recommend is, so let's use some simple numbers. If you get rid of 1,200 calories an hour, take a third of them back on. So bring mm. 400 calories on. Mm. And that means your tank is still going to be full. Yeah. So use, yeah. use, use, use um, a car or a bank as an example. If you constantly output and put nothing back in, you're going to run out. If you constantly output and put the exact same back in, your balance will stay the same. So your weight yeah. will stay the same. Yeah. But if you keep more out than less in, you'll be see tipping, tipping down. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. But you're going to yeah. keep it fueled as well. And it can be hard. It can be hard to track calories. I mean, uh, along with heart rate monitors, apps, and all these gizmos that are very common now that people are using. There's a there's also there's a great you put me onto this one, Sean. Um, what's the name of the app for tracking the calories? Uh, my Fitness Pal. My Fitness Pal. Yeah. yeah. Really, really, really useful app actually. And when yeah. I start using it first, when I when I was out with you. And um, when I thought, actually, do you know what? I'm probably not eating enough. It's, it's it's really it's really interesting how much calories you're actually eating during the day without realizing what you're eating. It's really I interesting. Tracking. Yeah, I yeah, very much so. Very, very much so. Like this whole thing, and again, it's probably going off topic, but I think it's important to say, like you physically cannot drop weight unless you're in a calorie deficit. Yeah. And if you're not dropping weight, you're not in a calorie deficit. Yeah. You know, yeah. and... I'm only eating 600 calories, you're not losing weight, you're not. Yeah. You're underestimating it. 100%. One of the really, one of the cracking ones I had recently enough, this year it was, um, 
came in adamant, absolutely adamant that she was only eating a thousand calories, so much so that she, she was getting angry with me, you know. And then just a bit of probing, it turned out she was having four bulletproof coffees a day, which had 250 calories from coconut oil in them, which is a thousand, <laughs> a thousand calories to coconut oil that she wasn't including. You know, oh, okay, yeah. calories are in everything, how we cook our food, oils, sauces, butters. So liquid calories are overlooked because they don't make us full. Yep. Or we, we grossly underestimate, no, nah, that's 30 grams of oats. No, it's not 60. Yeah, you know? yeah. Nah, that's 30 grams of pasta. No way is it. Unless, and one of the big things people say to me is, oh, it's just too hard to track calories. I'm very black and white in this. If you want to lose weight, you have to put a bit of effort in. And if it means getting in my fitness pal and weighing your food for a week or two yep. to understand exactly what you're having, yep. that's what it's going to take. Yep. You yep. know? Absolutely right. Yeah. 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 No, it's good advice. It's good advice. Sean, there's one more question. Um, it's an interesting one. Um, does your heart rate spike when you get hit? So this is from a kickboxing athlete, um, a female kickboxing athlete. Does your heart rate spike when you get hit? I don't know the answer to that. My spidey senses says, yeah, probably. Depending on say, how hard you get hit. <laughs> I would say definitely. Um, yeah. I've, ne I've never tested it and I should because when I, <laughs> when, when I monitor my athletes, I sit out external. I sit out of the octagon or out of the ring with, when they have a monitor on and I look at their data. Yeah. Um, I would imagine just solely based on adrenaline. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, I would have thought so. It's a shock to the system, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And again, where did you get hit? Do you get punched in the nose or do you get a body shot? Do you get kicked? Like, yeah. I would definitely say, yeah. But I would question, why is the question there? Is she concerned that there's too many spikes in her heart rate tracking? I don't know. Or, I can find out. Yeah, I can go back yeah, to like, and ask, yeah. If it's just a general question, I would, I would say, yeah, to be honest. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, maybe I maybe I after I don't know. Maybe she feels after getting getting hit, she feels I don't know tired after or something. Maybe she's linking it that way together. I don't know. I remember when we're we're sparring, we're going to be anaerobic. Yeah, without a shadow of a doubt. So it depends yeah. on how far into the spar and, and things yeah, like exactly. That. And if we're not used to controlling our breath, um, inhale and exhale, there's a chance you could be holding your breath while you're taking a couple of shots, which is not going to help either. No, absolutely not. Let that yeah. byproduct out. So don't, yeah. don't, don't yeah. hold the breath, you know. Yeah, so a lot of people do hold their breath, um, but remember when we exhale, we get rid of that byproduct. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not going to I'm not going to keep you too much longer. You've been really good, but I want to tap into something you've recently qualified as a nutritional therapist. Congrats! Four years hard, four yeah, years yeah, hard, yeah. hard slog. Um, yeah, it was. It's it's gone pretty quick, you know. It's um, yeah. believe yeah. it or not, like my son is four, four and a half, and only last night we were talking about it, and I was like. Um, I started college when he was a baby, you know, well, like, yeah, which, yeah. which I don't remember. I have a, a two-year-old daughter as well, and um, it's just yeah, it's it's been on Friday, Friday the first, so just Friday gone. I graduated online, yeah. basically. Congrats! Um, well, it, it would be uh, remiss of me to let you go without a nutritional question. So, so we're talking about training and heart rates, and ninety ninety odd percent of the questions came in from combat sport athletes. Prepping for a high intensity training session, prepping nutritionally, nutritional strategies for high intensity training sessions. What advice would you give to, to uh, combat sport athletes? Right, so we have to remember here um, high intensity sessions 100% are going to be reliant on glu uh, glucose, which is carbohydrate. So you have to make sure that you've had a carbohydrate containing meal mm. that day. So depending on what time your training session is at, depending on how digestively well you function. Um, you this is a lot of que like the questions are going to be put back a lot to the athletes as to how they function like I know personally for me I could have a meal two hours prior like last night before I went and did hill sprints I had a meal two hours prior beforehand and I was fine you know like I, there, there was no fun. I had a, a, a rice kind of container it was like a, a homemade curry with chicken potatoes veg bit of rice and I when I was eating it I was like I'm going to be running sprints in the next two hours, but I knew I, I was fine. You know, digestively, I was fine. I know people that need four hours, you know, yeah. um, that they need to be aware of it. But you have to, I had a I had a, an athlete recently, recently, I know I keep talking recently, I haven't worked in six weeks, but uh, <laughs> this year was, we'd done a VO2 test at the start of the year and then he went ketogenic and came back and did another VO2 test and his performance was so poor. Bombs. So when you're, yeah performing at high intensities your supply of energy yeah. is glucose however you don't necessarily need to 
overdo it. You don't need to have three bowls of rice and a load of bread and just work, look at what works for you. You know, mm -hmm. make sure the meal contains your food groups, protein, carbohydrate, and fats. So we don't want to just have a carbohydrate containing meal that causes a blood sugar spike. And by the time you get to training, you've had a, a crash in blood sugar, which is going to promote cortisol, which is going mm -hmm. to be a stress hormone. So look at balancing it. If we contain, have a carbohydrate containing meal with um, protein, and carbo or protein and fats, it will slow the absorption rate down. We'll get a higher satiation factor. So yeah. good carbohydrates, look at kind of brown rice, brown pasta, yeah, yeah. brown breads. Like yeah. carbohydrates aren't bad. Carbs yeah. get such a bad rap. Like they do, need, they do. We need to function with carbohydrates. Yeah. But um, Sean, but Sean, <laughs> I've heard this lots of times. I have to cut weight, Sean, and carbohydrates make me fat. Yeah. So I have to go ketogenic to be a performance athlete. Oh. And then and then they understand and then they own it. they don't understand why they can't perform on their spar. Yeah, I've sat at ringside with I've coached people who've gone ketogenic. Their their nutritionist said this is the best way to lose weight for your fight, and they're gone. They're on the chair, Sean, in between rounds, and they're white. Mm. I don't feel right. I don't feel right. I think I might have ate too much this morning. All these excuses, you know, and it boils down to the fact that the ketogenic diet has no positive benefits at all to high perform like to athletes who are. Going to going to perform within those high intensity uh, zones, but it, it can't. Like oh. when you when you break what it is down, it it, it can't. It possibly like they, there's there's no way it can because your body p relies on a glycolytic pathway to supply energy. Yeah, and if you're not consuming glycogen and carbohydrate, you you're not going to be able to do it. No. So to like to go back to the question, like there's no right or wrong meal to have realistically like one of a pre-training meal i love is rice and beans you know like absolutely optimal health in terms of all your bank of amino acids is done which is your proteins brown rice mixed with beans slow absorption through satiation of the protein in the beans mm. it doesn't have like baked beans are fine mm. there's not wrong with baked beans but like if you're getting baked beans could you throw in a mixture of beans some kidney beans some colonian beans you know some Absolutely. chickpeas yeah, yeah. You know, like it's a really it's a super pre or post meal you know yeah. but it's about working out what works for that athlete um you, do you want to have a carbohydrate drink with you when you're training it's not a problem but i wouldn't be overly telling you to whack it into you now, where you obviously train, you can't do the likes of carb rinsing or carb washing unless yeah. there's a sink close by. So yeah. just a brief, I'm a big fan of carb rinsing and carb washing. So for you, yeah. anyone that doesn't know it, it's when you get a carbohydrate drink and swish it around your mouth and spit it back out. Yeah. So the enzyme that's needed to break down carbohydrates called salivary amylase, and that's produced in the mouth. So it will give your brain a signal that you've consumed carbohydrate when you haven't, and it will give you a temporary boost in performance for a short mm -hmm. period of time. Mm -hmm. You see tennis players do it a lot. Um, yeah, we do a lot in combat sports because we've got the bucket ringside. Oh, can, yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Can, can, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Like it, yeah, yeah. There's some great studies on it. However, what's really important with carb rinsing and carb washing is that the athlete has consumed carbohydrate Beforehand. on the day or yeah. the day before. Mm -hmm. Because if the, you don't have the glycogen storage to dig deep into, your yeah. body can't, like, although it's a trick, it, it still needs to have, yeah. make sure that you've consumed carbohydrate. But yeah. What would be, would it be Lucozade or flat coke? Lucozade, or? yeah, normally Lucozade, the uh, the flat Lucozade, the isotonic Lucozade, you can get the two, the two euro bottles. Yeah, so sure, look, when you break it down, to. it was originally developed for diabetics, so it is already glucose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, that, that's what it is. It, it's ready to go into your bloodstream straight away. Yeah. So, yeah, carb rinsing. And it's readily available. It's readily available too, which is always handy. Yeah, and like, so I think psychologically it does a lot more than what it actually does. Hmm. Like, if you're going in for a, a spar or something like and you've been eating well and you're eating your main meals and you're having your fruit and veg and, like, you're, you're not going to run out of energy because you're going to have it stored. You're 500 grams yeah. available, you know, like you're not yeah. going to go yeah. through 2,000 calories of carbohydrate in a sparring session. Yeah. Unless the sparring session is going for an hour and a half or yeah. two. Yeah, 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 it's a good point. Last one, Sean. Where did the whole myth around carbs making you fat come from? Why do people say, don't eat carbs? What's that all about? Carbs are the devil. It used to um, be fat. It used to be fat back in the day. Don't eat fat. Yeah. Well, where did where did where did it switch over to carbs? How did that all happen? Uh, I think there's another. I think there's a couple of points on carbs. Um, carb for every gram of carbohydrate you eat, or every gram of carbohydrate you store, you do store four grams of water. 
Yeah. And, and, and that's without it, that, that's fact, that's science, okay? So when we reduce carbohydrate consumption, we reduce water retention and we will naturally drop weight. So a couple of days into a low carbohydrate diet, you think, Jesus, this is great. My weight's down yeah. massively. Yeah. Now, what? maybe this is an answer why they got the bad rap. Why I think it gets a good rap is because when we consume carbohydrate, we tend to consume high quantities of poor quality with an oil or an sauce. So nobody eats pasta on its own. Mm. Okay, you don't eat bread on its own. You don't eat rice on its own. You eat pasta with a creamy or oily sauce. Yeah, that tends to come with garlic bread or a jarred sauce, or we eat rice that comes with a jarred sauce. So what we're doing is we're consuming a lower quality product mixed with a high calorie containing product to give the flavor and the taste, and we overconsume it. So it comes down to calories. So I know this, you know this. But people just automatically assume, and I can understand. I've had people that go, I can't lose weight, can't lose weight, and I go, right, let's go low carb. And it doesn't mean I've gone low carb just to trigger weight loss. I've gone low carb because I know it's going to go mean low calorie. Yeah. So if course. you go low carb, you're going to have to have a higher quality product come into your body, i.e., clean sources of protein, good clean source of fat. So the quality of your food consumption greatly improves. You get more veg, you get more fruit, you get more lean source of protein. So yeah. carbs get a bad rap because carbs tend to be highly processed, highly palatable food that we yeah. consume yeah. extremely high quantities of. Yeah, sounds you good. Know? Yeah, it's good advice. It's Sean, any athletes, any athletes out there that are listening um, to this, to us having a, a ramble, um, if they wanted to get serious about their training and they wanted to get tested, how can they go about it? Right, so obviously due to the situation that we're in, um, testing isn't happening at the moment. However, um, we will be back. There's no doubt about that. Um, we'll be back. And I know I can see already with the amount of emails coming in that, that I'm going to be busy. But we will definitely be back. There's no doubt about that. Um, when we'll be back, I don't know. I'm like the rest of you. I'm hoping as much as, as early as I can. I don't think it's going to happen before July. Like August 10th is when they say it's going to be. But yeah. yeah. Um, Look, let's aim at that. I'm based, my facilities up in West Park Fitness in Tala. Uh, we do day, evening and weekend appointments. It's a matter of just giving me a call. So I'm available on uh, myhealthmatters.ie. Uh, my number's on that. That's myhealthmatters.ie. We're on Facebook at Health Matters Ireland. We're on Instagram at Health Matters 6411. And Twitter at Health Matters, Matters with one T. Unfortunately, all my handles aren't the same because they were set up at different times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I'm sure you can put some notes or a link to the platforms if you're going to be promoting this on, on social media. But look, Seriously. if if you didn't get any of them handles and you just want to get you on, get my number. Look, at the end of the day, if you send me an email, I'm going to ask you for your number. So yeah. it's just, just ring me anytime, yeah. send me a text anytime. And I do yeah. day, evening and weekend appointments. So availability-wise, I... I'm quite flexible as long as you can get in. Yeah. There's a bit of criteria, two hours before your test, there's no food, tea, coffee, or any stimulants, and, and no exercise on the day. You can train the day before, but we would ask you to take it relatively easy. Consultation time's approximately an hour. Yeah. Sounds You're not going to be running for an hour. No. <laughs> Half an hour, maybe? Half an hour, um, 40 minutes, tops? The, the max, 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 max is going to be is yeah. 24 minutes, but like yeah. you're looking at like a, between a 15, 20 minute test, but... Yeah. Yeah. you'll know your work at that point. Absolutely. Sean, thanks for your time. It's always a pleasure to chat and always very educational. No um, water. Thanks for having me. I really enjoy it. Appreciate, appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us. Um, I'm going to get this, hopefully um, I can get this up on social media sometime later on this evening or first thing tomorrow morning seems to be the best time to get okay. stuff kind of tracking. So, Sean, thanks a million. We'll, no uh, we'll stay in touch soon, okay? Cheers, pal. Thanks a million. Thanks Take a care. Lot. Bye, Thank bye, you. bye.